I finally found Maharaji. Maharaji said, what are you doing here? I said, Maharaji, I can't stand my impurities. You've got to save me. I just can't stand it. I said, I'm not pure enough to do whatever it is I'm supposed to do. So he hit me on the head and he said, you will be. <laughs> well, in guru talk, that's big stuff, you know. I mean. <laughs> so I watched for immediate effect. <laughs> but not a hell of a lot happened. And a few months later, I said, Maharaji, you promised me. <laughs> and he pulled my beard and he laughed and he said, you will be. And a year and a half later, in 72, when he was throwing me out of India again, I said, look, Maharaji, you can't send me back to America. I'm still a mess. <laughs> And he said, here, eat this mango. So I took that mango. And there were all these other devotees around, and I wasn't going to share that mango with anybody. You know? I just took that mango into the bathroom. I would have eaten the seed if I could have. You know? I even thought if I plant the seed, I'll get more mangoes, and then I can liberate others. You know? The mango. It's the mango. Mango Baba. <laughs> and nothing happened. <laughs> but he said, see, he said to me, um, one day I said to uh, one of his Indian devotees, I said, Maharaji can't send me back to America because I'm really liable to screw up other human beings' lives, and I don't mind screwing up my own karma. I don't want to do it, but uh, I really don't want to screw around with other people's karma. And, uh, you know, he's legitimizing me and then sending me into the lion's mouth, and I may screw up, and I don't really want to hurt other people. And this man came back saying, Maharaji said he'd never let you do anything wrong in America. And when I came before Maharaji, I said, Maharaji, can't you see how impure I am? See, and he looks. <laughs> and he looked up and down and all around. He says, I don't see any impurity. Well, he said something, and the translator said, Maharaji doesn't see any impurity. <clears throat> Later I learned, by the way, all the time I thought Maharaji was saying what the translator said. This is very far out, just an aside, see? <laughs> Turns out that Maharaji was one of the most foul-mouthed people in existence. He used to be known as... He used to be known as Latrine Baba, and... Um, <laughs> he called everybody sister fuckers, and... Um, he used to talk about us that way, and, but the Indian devotees didn't want to hurt our feelings, so they translate... He'd probably say, get that sister fucker out of here, and the translator would say, Maharaji says you're looking very well, <laughs> It's really hard to know what the transmission was uh, at any time and form. But at any rate, I came back to America in 72 with the clear protection that Maharaji had guaranteed I would, could do nothing wrong, which meant he was taking on my karma, which gave me license to do anything, you understand. And that was really the worst thing he could have said because I would let myself go further and further out and out and out and say, well, I'll try that. Because after all, it's in the moment, and he said he'd never let me do anything wrong, so it must be protected. Now, it wasn't all, uh, I mean, it's not all quite that horrible, you know. Because what was happening to me was 
that the purity of the yearning of the people that came towards me, towards me, I'm going to go to my Boston accent, towards me, <laughs> elicited from me something that wasn't what I still was. You understand? It took out of me something more than I was. In other words, somebody would come forward who really wanted God or really wanted liberation. And I just, that stuff in me, that worldly stuff just couldn't function. It was like their purity of their desire was a demand upon me that pulled out of me stuff that was higher than I was, if you will, or higher than I acknowledged myself to be because I was so busy feeling identified with my desires, with my lust, with my anger, with my unworthiness, with my, all the stuff you're identifying with, for the most part. Not all of you at all moments. But all the time, this is very interesting, by the way. I've never given this kind of a lecture in years now. There's something about the intimacy of this room that's making it into a hanging out scene for me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Usually I get up and I, I go up till I'm practically stiff and I start in God is light, you know, or breathe into your heart and I just start to take us all up and we can go up later. I mean, that's okay with me, but I, I keep you down. You couldn't know what you're laughing at. Beautiful laugh. But you see, I'm caught just like you're caught in the predicament that we are in the world and we are in an incarnation and we have babies and jobs and world and parents and karma that we've been, we're working out and we can't sort of say, hey, just hold it, you know, don't move until I get enlightened, <laughs> you know, because I don't want to hurt you. You know, you got to stay in the stew and keep working. And it's impure, but what can you do? It's, that's just the way it is. The only added burden that I had was that people were looking towards me to liberate them. And what a horror for people to look towards you to liberate them when you can't liberate yourself. You know, it's like the statement is made in India, if you're caught in quicksand, you can't free another. Or if you're bound in chains, Ramakrishna says, you can't untie the hands of another. And I kept saying to everybody, watch it. I mean, I kept, you know, giving a declaimer. You know, the management takes no responsibility. I, I'd say, you know, I am not enlightened. I'm not realized. I am a teaching. I'm not a teacher. You know, I'm full of hang-ups. Just, I'm one of us just talking to us. Just take me for what it's worth. If it doesn't touch your heart, forget it. It's probably phony. <laughs> okay? And I said that every lecture. I just kept saying it again and again. And that sort of got me off the hook. Or sucked everybody in deeper, whichever way you want to look at it. The power of apparent honesty. Around 1970, this is, this is six. I guess it was the summer of 74. I was at Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado, giving a course in the Bhagavad Gita.
Now, it was a great summer, there was no doubt about that. We all had a fascinating time. There was a great spark between Trungpa Rinpoche and me, and it was all like a tennis match. And <laughs> I understand from Rolling Stone, he referred to me as a, an arrogant, confused charlatan going in the wrong direction. <laughs> That's a true mark of respect I take from <laughs> Well, it was a pretty strange summer. And by the time I had finished it, I had decided that I had taken enough people down the primrose path, and I couldn't stand it anymore, and I was going to get out. It was just too heavy. I just felt that what had happened was, you see, I didn't understand, and I still don't understand, I had no idea who Trungpa is, but he was obviously a Tantra <coughs> teacher of some sort, and I couldn't quite assess how far out Tantra gets. And um, a lot of the things that were going on in the Institute were, uh, I was having to keep swallowing my nice Jewish middle-class righteousness and say, well, it's for the greater good and he's just burning stuff out of people and it's all great teaching. And it might have been, it might be, it may be well, I don't know. But I was getting uneasy because I was going beyond where my heart was clicking. It wasn't clicking for me. And I can get pretty far out when I'm working with an individual, but it's got to always click along the way now. I understand what that means. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's like, there are a lot of things that by the book you'd say, oh no, don't do that. But at some moment it'll click and it's okay to do it, while a moment later it wouldn't be all right to do it, or a moment before it wouldn't have been all right to do it. And the scene wasn't clicking for me. So I decided to go back to India. I don't know why, my guru was dead. And though I intellectually said, Dead Schmidt, where can he go? <laughs> you know, it's like he's just dropped his body, you know, it's no big deal. Because in 1972, one day, I was sitting in the courtyard opposite him. He was on the other side, and there were all these devotees sitting around him, rubbing his feet, and they'd give him apples, and he'd throw them at apples, and he'd talk to them. And it was that kind of loving, bhakti, delicious, rich kind of hanging out with the guru. It was, it's a, if you've ever been in it, you know what I'm talking about. And if you can't, it's like a, um, it's a great night by the fire where you're all cuddly. And it's really soft and loving and warm. And the only thing is it's all connected with liberation, right? Not just sensual gratification. So it's a little different quality. But other than that, it's that same feeling of at-homeness and the time stops and you're just in a delicious space and I was sitting across watching all this going on and saying boy they're all hung up in his form you know I don't really care if I never see him again I love him I love him tremendously but that isn't it I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life rubbing his feet I mean that isn't what this is all about I have to go beyond seeing it in him and not in me in other words, the guru, it's called Guru Kripa, is a method of pursuing or following or devotion to the guru. But ultimately, every method is a trap, and you've ultimately got to consume the method. You've got to go beyond the method. And ultimately, the way it works is I remember sitting with Maharaji one night, late in the afternoon. It was just sort of sunset. It was a beautiful, quiet moment in the temple. And... Um, I sat and he was talking to me and throwing things and patting me and doing all this kind of stuff he does. And I decided I'm not going to be sucked in by it. That's like, um, that's the melodrama on this plane. And everybody's always sucked in by it, but I, forget it. I'm going to focus on my third eye and I'm just going to meditate. Screw him. I'm just not going to do it. I'm just not going to look. You know, I won't respond. He can throw the apples. I'm not going to catch him. Nothing. <laughs> so I focused on my third eye and a minute later, this Shakti started to pour into me and I started to go like this and he went over on his side and pulled his blanket over his head and he started to snore. 
<laughs> and suddenly the universe started to fall away from me and then he sat up and he said, and I was getting stiff and going into samadhi, and he said to the uh, translator that was there, he said, uh, ask Ramdas how much money Stephen makes. Okay. And I heard that, it's like uh, the plane has just left Aspen, it's just lifting up over the mountains, and you see somebody down in the airport waving, you know, it's from that distance, that kind of thing. I heard, ask Ramdas how much, and I thought, oh, wow, you know, where's that coming from? <laughs> And I heard the, I heard the uh, devotee say, oh, Baba, he, I can't bother him, he's meditating. And he says, ask him, ask him, never mind, he's meditating. And the guy was so apologetic, and I had to come down. You know, you've got to turn the plane around, go into the landing pattern, and you finally land. And I land, and I came down, I finally said, I said, $30,000. And then I went back up, I wasn't going to win it. And I began to see that he was like a set of infinite doorways and that if you grabbed on the physical plane, that's what you got. And if you didn't get hung up on that, you got the astral one. You started to meet Shiva or Hanuman or whoever. And if you didn't get hung up in that one, which is very seductive, by the way, because it's fun to have Christ walk into the room or, you know, Shiva dance for you or the Divine Mother come and offer her breast or something like that. But if you can say, yeah, baby, that's fine, but that's not what I want, you know, I'm going for broke. And that too, tatuamasi, all that stuff, keep going, you know, step aside, please, here I go. You just keep going through the doors and you keep going beyond guru, you go beyond the dualism and it's a method of merging in which you finally close in and then you understand what Ramana Maharshi said when he said God, guru and self are the same thing. That it's just a vehicle of love and opening and through the love of the beloved, lover, beloved, lover, beloved, you merge. It's like an orgasm, and you merge into union, except it's not an orgasm in time, which is what our genital sexual orgasms we generally find. It, it is something where you merge in, and then you never unmerge when you finally merge. You may be in form separately, but you are always merged. There's only one of it after that. That's what a realized being is. There's nobody there. There's just forms acting. Well, that's later. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> if I promise, then I've got to put into the computer to remember to close that thing, so I don't know. I used to lecture in the acid days, and I would get six or seven digressions going at once. <laughs> and the audience would all be hanging, and I'd be hanging, <laughs> whether we were going to drop one of them along the way. You know? And I remember going home one night, feeling very satisfied with the evening, and in the middle of the night, waking up, realizing I had left one unclosed, you know? <laughs> and knowing somebody in the audience knew. You know? <laughs> with all my... somebody knew. And so as I sat looking at Maharaji across the courtyard, See, we've got three going now. <laughs> we've got social responsibility, we've got Naropa, and we've got Maharaji in the courtyard. Okay. And the mountains, we've got the mountains going too, we've got four. Don't be sloppy. You can't be lazy in these gatherings. You've got to work too. Whenever anybody has enough, you should go home, by the way. Okay? Because this is like hamburger or a veggie burger, it just keeps coming out and coming out and coming out, you know, I mean, it's just so much stuff, and you know what you need, and don't take more than you need. It doesn't go anywhere. There isn't an in conclusion, let me say, you know. It's not like We are. <laughs> okay. As I sat across from Maharaji in the courtyard, and I thought, I don't need him. You know, what am I doing hanging in this? It's, I've got dysentery. You know, I've lost 40 pounds. I'm sitting here. All I'm being fed is porries cooked in grease and potatoes. You know. And I'm rubbing the feet of this man, if I'm lucky, five minutes a day. You know? 
And here I am, I'm 40 years old. I mean, what is this? You know, like, how long does this go on? Is this, you know? And I suddenly saw that, that the method was more far out than that. And I was ready to let go of that form of it. And I, saw, I thought to myself, it really doesn't matter whether I'm with him or not. And at that moment, I saw him lean over to this old Indian devotee who came running across the courtyard and got down on his knees and touched my feet, which surprised me. <laughs> And I touched his feet, which is, you know, we out-touch each other's feet. And I said, why did you do that? He said, well, Maharaji said, go touch Ram Dass's feet because he and I understand each other perfectly. <laughs> right? He's saying, you're right, baby, don't get hung up. Don't get caught in the form. And it was true. Every time I came to visit him, he always threw me out. All the other people he let hang in. I hated them. <laughs> Three months, he'd have me on, on pilgrimage. And I'd come back, and I'd come in from on the train at six in the morning. Four in the morning, the train would arrive. Indian trains always arrive in the middle of the night. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> and, the, and then you get an ox cart or something, <laughs> rickshaw from the station. And you finally, the temple opens at six, and you get in, and you finally see him, and he says, you walk in, and you're home. You're at the feet of the guru. And you fall at his feet, and he says, go to Delhi. <laughs> oh my God, I just got here. You know, is there no rest? You know? <laughs> so he was dead, but I thought, well, I didn't need him anyway. But I was, that was a bit of a head trip. You know, in my gut, I was still like working out the grief reaction and the feeling of loss and the feeling that's, this is a church, I guess I should. <laughs> that son of a bitch has walked out on me and left me. You know, and that isn't fair. Even though I remembered what Ramana Maharshi said when he was dying of cancer and his arm was cancerous, and they said, uh, Babaji, Bhagawan, you have all these powers, heal yourself. And he said, no, this body's all used up. And they started to cry and they said, oh, Bhagawan, don't leave us, don't leave us. And he said, don't be silly, where could I go? Like, all I'm doing is dropping my body. It's no big deal. I'm not going anywhere. That's your problem. That's like somebody coming up to you and saying, I'm selling my Chevrolet, and you say, oh, don't sell your Chevrolet, don't sell your Chevrolet. So what I was doing was I was going out and I would sit and meditate with Maharaji and I had his pictures and I had his pictures in my car and in my bedroom and my puja room and I talked to him all day long and I did his mantra and I was just feeling his presence all the time but I, you know, he still had split and I wasn't too sure but it seemed okay and I felt like he was guiding me and every time something good would go I'd say thank you, Maharaji, and every time anything bad would go, I'd say, it's a good teaching, Maharaji, thank you. You know, and I had the whole game going, but it was a little bit here. It wasn't fully right here. Right? So I've now left Naropa, and I'm going to go back to India. I don't know what I'm going back for, but I figure I'll do some Buddhist meditation or something, and that'll be good, clean up my act a bit. And I was trying, I mean, all you, even in America, I was doing things like in the spring before I went to Naropa, I had been on tour with Allen Ginsberg raising money for Naropa. And we ended up at one point, we were in Santa Fe. And we were, had a number of days before our next gig in Albuquerque. And um, 
You're not supposed to call them gigs. You're supposed to call them <laughs> spiritual gatherings. <laughs> and we were in a sauna bath. And there was a Tibetan nun, and um, Alan, and a boy with Alan, and another, there were about eight of us. I think Bhagwan Das was there, and we were all sort of lying in this bath, sauna bath, just hanging out, going out in the sun, coming back into the bath. And a telegram arrived for me saying, the um, Rohatsu Dai Sashin is being held uh, at Mount Baldy in Los Angeles. This is the most difficult of the Zen sittings each year. Uh, we are holding a space for you. It starts, uh, which was the next day. Now, I didn't ask them to hold a space. And I thought, wow, I don't want to go sit in a Zen sashim for nine days. I don't think I could do it anyway. So I called them up and I said, thank you very much, but um, that's not for beginners and I'm a beginner. And they said, oh no, you could do it. And there was my ego, see. <laughs> you could do it. And it was a girl, the, the abbess was a woman. And the way she said it. <laughs> so I was on a plane going to Los Angeles. <laughs> And I arrive at the uh, Zen place, and I, here I've, you know, I've made this sacrifice. I've left the sauna bath, <laughs> flown to Los Angeles, go up to this cold mountain outside of Los Angeles, and I'm met by a guy in a black outfit with a clipboard, <laughs> shaved head, and I expect, oh, Ramdas was so happy you could come. You know, I expect a little bit of ego feeding, you know. Das, Ram, you will be in bunk six. <laughs> Here is your uniform, you know. <laughs> Brother John will show you how to put it on, and you ought to be in the Zendo in six minutes. You know, something like that. Okay, baby, I'll play, you know, and I go in and I set my bunk up, and you're not supposed to look at anybody or talk to anybody. And I go and sit, and they got this guy that walks back and forth with a stick, see. And you, yeah, I'm, most of you may know all this routine. You gotta sit like this. And if you tilt, or if you do anything, like this, anything, he comes up to you, and he's a Korean. He <laughs> comes up to you and he, he bows. Uh-oh. And you bow, it's got you. And you put your hands down like this, and he hits you three times on the shoulder with this stick, which is supple, and it stings, right? Whoosh. And then you go over on this side, and he does three on that side, and then he bows, and you bow, and you go like that. <laughs> Nine days, okay? <laughs> Up at two every morning, with four minutes to get from sleep into the zendo, dressed, washed, right, toileted. You can't imagine what it's like in the pitch black with all these beings in black outfits <laughs> rushing to toilets, toothpaste, zendo. Uh, and you get in and at two in the morning and it's cold up there and it snowed. And the, the, your sinuses, I was getting sicker and sicker and the sinuses were draining, you know. And so you go, and, he'd, and you'd hear, shh. And if you did it twice, <laughs> and there was a guy on the next cushion. They never beat him, see? But everybody beat me all the time. See, they took turns. We all took turns carrying the stick, and I never beat anybody because, well, I beat somebody now and then. There was always some scapegoat we all beat, you know? <laughs> I was sort of... I was the second one of those. Yeah. 
I was always trying to find the teacher being sloppy. That was my whole goal. If I could just find, just once, just once, if I could get that Korean. <laughs> so this guy in the next Zafu never, and you were only allowed, see, I, he walked in front of me when we went to breakfast. We had to walk in single file, and we had to run, see. And in the night, all you'd see is his sneakers, and the sneakers were too big for him, and he kept flopping. <laughs> so I spent nine days watching these flopping sneakers, and um, his name was Leonard Cohen. He's a singer that you must know. And nobody ever hit him, see. Me, they were beating to a pulp. <laughs> and I was getting sicker and sicker, and I was plotting how to get out of this scene. You know, I was thinking, could I have a telegram saying I'd been called away or, you know, an emergency or remember I had a lecture or something? And I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Four times a day you went in to visit the Roshi, who was this tough, squat Japanese at about 65. Um, I've told the story, so some of you have heard it, but it's a useful story in, in this context. The way I got to into this, meet this guy, was that there was a gathering at a Benedictine monastery of a lot of holy beings, supposedly, at one point, a year prior to that, and each of them did his trip on all the others. There was Sa Swami Satchidananda, and there was this Sazaki Roshi, and Pierre Velayat Khan was there, and there were Brother David from the Christians, and there was somebody from everywhere. And uh, as Shlomo Karlbach was there for the Hasids, and you know, everybody, the teams were all represented. <laughs> and there was a time when we were all sitting, uh, Sashin, and I was sitting next to Swami Satchidananda, and Sazaki Roshi was walking back and forth, and he'd given us the koan, how do you know your Buddha nature through the sound of a grasshopper, a cricket? because there were crickets outside. And so when it came my turn, and we were taught how to get in and bow with a certain number of times and all, and you sit down, and you sit in, it's called Dokasan, you come in, you sit down, and he's got a bell and a stick, see? And he, ah, doctor, doctor, how you know your Buddha nature through sound of cricket? So I knew that was the koan, see, and I'd been sitting out there waiting for my turn. <coughs> thinking, now, what, how would you know your Buddha nature? <laughs> See, you're not supposed to do that, but I figured, what the hell? You know? <laughs> so I concluded that the best thing to do when he asked me that was to hold my hand up to my ear, which is what Milarepa does, See, listening to the sounds of the universe outside his cave. And I figured, here is a Jewish Hindu in a Zen Buddhist scene. I'll give him a Tibetan Buddhist and my chips and go. I can be a good yoga teacher. It's enough already for this lifetime. I don't have to be real. Forget it. I'm getting sicker and sicker and madder and madder and more and more just bored and disgusted. Finally, about the fourth or fifth day, I'm walking up to see this guy, and I haven't solved this one koan I've been given now for four days. And I'm standing up there, and I think, I don't give a what the answer to that koan is. Screw this whole scene. I've had enough. It's all... And I walk into him and I sit down and he says, Ah, doctor, how you know? And he gives me the thing. And I say, Good morning, Roshi. Like, let's cut the crap, Roshi. Good morning. Enough for it. Ah, doctor, you are becoming a beginning student of Zen. <laughs> it's always the up level, right? Well, I walked three feet off the ground, you know, I mean, I really made it. And the bushes were all burning and the lights, the sky was all radiant. It's called a minor satori. And in the next four days, I was solving koans left and right. I was just in the flow. It was just, I had clicked in. I had freaked so badly, I had flipped in. And I thought, I'm enlightened. And it lasted about a week. It was a, what would be called a traumatic high. I'm getting technical in my analysis of the ways in which people get high. <laughs> you can fall off a cliff and you can do the same thing. Uh, it's a trauma that uh, pushes you, opens you very quickly, very dramatically. But it overrides your karma and it's still there. And the minute it gets a chance, it sneaks back in and grabs you. And <laughs> 
pulls you back down. Okay? So I was, during those periods of time, working still in myself with things like that. And they would clean up my act, and I would get clean, and then I would come back into my stuff again. And I was just going up and down and up and down, the familiar roller coaster that we all know all too well, I assume, by now. Okay, we've left Naropa. We're going to go back to India, because nothing's really working. It's all getting better, it's getting clearer, but it still hasn't flipped around. I'm still an unworthy <coughs> phony who has moments of holiness, okay? I'm not a holy being, a being of the spirit who now and then falls. You understand that distinction? Okay. It's just which foot you're unbalanced on. If you imagine a wheel with a hub in the center, and the hub is liberation, and the wheel is the wheel of births and deaths, and your weight is on the foot on the births and deaths, and now and then, through intense trauma or sadhana, or the love of the guru or something, you can flip over and get some weight into that foot, and you get, ah, and you see who you are, and it's all beautiful, and then you're off balance and you go back on that foot. Because that's home. It's like, I ought to meditate. See, that's that one. Then later, the thing hopefully flips. And then your weight is here, and you're doing that, and you say, I ought to stop meditating and do the dishes. Right? You got that? I mean, that's the flip over, okay? I am now in Pennsylvania on my way to India. I am in a very crummy motel. I'm going to watch the Senate Judiciary House Committee hearings. You remember those? Sam Irvin's follies. And there's a thunderstorm and the electricity goes on. So I am forced to meditate. It's too early to go to sleep. It's too dark to read. It's right by a major highway. I can't walk. So I got to sit. So I might as well meditate. I start to meditate. And who should appear in my room but Maharaji? Very clear. And he says to me, in whatever language you talk in those visions, you know, in your dreams, even though... He may be talking Hindi and you only understand English. Everybody understands each other perfectly. It's that one. It's, it's the language of, well, you understand. He says to me, you don't have to go to India. Your teachings will be right here. And then he disappears. The vision is so solid, and I'm now, by now, trusting enough of it, that I think, okay, I won't go to India. So I decide to go up to New Hampshire where I have a cabin on my father's farm and I'll go into the woods in the cabin and I'll just hang out until it all becomes clear. So I'm passing through New York City. I go to a chiropractor, a friend of mine. I figure I'll get aligned on the way through. I have to keep showing you I'm real. <laughs> Don't get angry. It's all Leela. And uh, there is a nice spiritual lady in New York who uh, I have been friends with for many years. So I call her up. She has, she's a, uh, she teaches, she has group meetings in New York, and she has many, she works on many planes, uh, mainly astral planes, and she has the unlikely name of Hilda. So I called up to say, hello, Hilda, how are you? And she says, oh, Ramdas, I'm so glad you called. There's somebody you must meet. And I said, well, Hilda, I really don't want to meet anybody. I'm on the way to New Hampshire. I'm going to sit in the cabin. She says, you've got to meet this person. I said, Hilda, look, I don't want to meet anybody. I've had enough people at Naropa. 
I really want to just go to my cabin. Nice talking to you. And I finish the alignment and I go over to visit some friends for a few hours before I head for New Hampshire. And I'm sitting there and in walks Hilda. She says, I've come over here because I heard you were here and you've just got to meet this woman. Hilda's in her 60s. I said, Hilda dear, I don't want to meet anybody. She says, wait, let me just call her up. So she calls her on the phone and she talks and she says, Ramda, she says you should come over because your guru is sitting in her basement. <laughs> well, though I knew all about spiritual materialism, she had me. So the next day I went over to uh, Brooklyn was brought into a very um, middle-class uh, house right next to a lot of other houses just like it. Brought down into a basement with a television and linoleum and a, a very kind of garishly decorated. And there is sitting this woman. Long, long, long false eyelashes, heavy mascara and eye shade shadow. Low dress. She looks like um, Gina Lola Brigitta in Never on Sunday. That quality. Right? Long dark hair down to her waist. Very attractive but peculiar because she is sitting there in Samadhi. Okay? <laughs> but like, man, really in Samadhi. I mean, I have a chance because Hilda says, go ahead and test if you'd like, dear. See, they're playing with me. Go ahead, dear. So I'm doing my whole routine. You go to push her and it's like a stone. It's like a, a marble statue. There's no life in it at all. See? I look, pulse, no pulse, no heartbeat. You go under the, with a mirror, no breath, nothing, you know. Eyes roll back. Very weird, I mean, you know. <laughs> like of all the models you have of what spiritual teachers are going to be like, uh, you know, you expect an old man in a blanket in the Himalayas, but what is a woman like with, you know, <laughs> in Brooklyn? I mean, it's, it's too unreasonable, you know. And she comes, finally, Hilda touches a, a brooch that has a mantra in it on her chest and the, she finally slowly comes back down to earth, plain. She opens her eyes, her eyes roll back down, she opens them and she loosens up and she looks at me and she says, I'm sorry about this language but I've just got to be straight and I know it's a church but this is all concerned with God at some level. And she looks at me and she says, what the fuck do you want? <laughs> now, of all the holy books I've read, <laughs> so I said, um, so Hilda said, this is Ramdas, dear. She says, I don't give a damn who he is. She says, does that fat man belong to you? Get him out of here. <laughs> and I look over, and there is a blanket with nothing on it, of course. So I said, well, I don't know whether that particular fat man belongs to me or not, because I can't see him. And at that point, she starts to go up, and she goes into a very sort of light trance, and Maharaji starts to talk to me through her. And he talks to me about total trivia in India. Like he talks to me about where they kept the rice in the temple. Something that I would never talk about in America, that this woman would have no way of knowing about, that Hilda didn't know about, that nobody, you know, it's just that. 
or a little detail of a thing where a sadhu was thrown out of the temple and I protested and what I said and who walked around the corner of the courtyard and he's telling me all this stuff and there's no doubt at all that's who it is. Not even a possibility that it's, it's being hyped because there's just no way in that one. Okay, he's got me. He said you'd receive your teachings in America. So I visit with her for a few days and then I go up to New Hampshire and she starts to telephone me every day for maybe three or four hours a day. And these telephone calls are very extraordinary because on the physical plane is this uh, 10th grade educated Brooklyn woman with, you know, very crude, tough, straight Brooklynese. But as she changes levels of consciousness, her language keeps changing, and there are hours on the phone when out is pouring poetry that is so breathtakingly beautiful that I've never read anything like it on the human plane because it's too precious to exist. It's like you can't stand it. You can't catch your breath. It's too beautiful. Just hours of it pouring out pouring out, all in beautiful, complex, rhyming structure. And she's starting to give me teachings. And these teachings are being, are, she is reading from a blackboard that is being written on by Jethro. That's Moses' father-in-law. That push you a bit out of shape? <laughs> see, I've lost about half of you by now. So you say, oh, come on now, baby. Whoa. I mean, I'm in the same position you are, you know. <laughs> Except it's happening to me. <clears throat> that was in August. And I visited her again in September and again in October for a few days each time. December 9th, I moved to New York. She put me into a place to live, and I just surrendered my life to her. She was my teacher. If there was one thing Maharaji said to me in the temples in India over and over again, he said, Ramdas, Watch out for women in gold. <coughs> and I'd be in the back of the temple and they'd say, Maharaji wants to see you. And I'd go running up and I'd come before him and he'd say, Ramdas, Kanchen Kamani, women in gold. I'd say, yes, Maharaji. Jiao, jiao, go away. <laughs> Do this five or six times a day. It seemed bizarre to me. I mean, it just didn't seem relevant. You know? Here I am now at the feet of this woman long, long, these plastic fingernails, dark red, you know. Heavy eyelashes, gold bracelets, gold rings, big, thick rings. Total, ugh. <laughs> and we are spending all of our time trying to keep her on the physical plane. She's in a traditional Italian family, so her husband expects she's going to take care of the house. So you get these calls, see, she says, I gotta, I'm washing the floor, I think I'm doing it all right, but she says, there's this guy standing in the kitchen, he's got eight arms, can I ask him to help me, right? <laughs> or would it be an insult? See, it's like, you got to understand how complicated this is, see, because she's new at the game, see, and because how it happened to her is very bizarre. This is only a few months into her scene, see. She's not a yogi from the Himalayas in this lifetime. She's a Jewish girl married to an Italian truck driver. She's got three kids and a Cadillac. They've made it big, right? And it's a tough scene, and she's a tough woman, and she 
has always been, like Gina, like Never on Sunday, that kind of purity quality, that kind of innocence that's tough innocence. Do you know what I'm talking about? The kind of innocence, um, innocence that is, um, you see, not in the same personality structure, but the kind of innocence you touch in somebody like Billy Budd or in James Dean in East of Eden, or you know that kind of, you know quality I'm talking about? Can I? It's like childlike innocence, but it's in an adult neurotic pattern, okay? But it's always still in. <laughs> so she's overweight, and she decides to go to a diving salon. And at this Jack LaLanne diving salon, which is her, turns out to be her yogic teachers, they say to her, there's a breath that'll get you thin if you breathe in one nostril and out the other. They keep doing it, you'll get thin. <laughs> she is a woman of great excesses, right? If you tell her to do it for 10 minutes, she waits until her husband goes to sleep, she's made love to him, then she goes into the bathroom, gets into the bathtub, and starts to do this breath for five hours. <laughs> she wants to get thin like that. So. After several days of this, suddenly, Christ appears in her bathroom. She says, look, what are you doing here? I'm a Jew. <laughs> But he is very um, incredibly beautiful and she experiences so much bliss that all day long she can only think of how to get back to that bathtub to do this breath in the hopes he'll come again. Okay? You all know what that feeling is like. So all day long she's housewife, goes to bed, makes love to her husband, which they've done every day since she was 15 when they got married. You know, and then runs into the bathtub as soon as the first snore starts, gets into the bathtub, starts doing the breath and waiting for Christ to come. <laughs> he comes twice and he says, um, I'm only going to come one more time. Comes a third time and um, there's a lot of other side stories which I'm sure will in, in time come out, but I'm not going to tell them now because it's... I'd like to keep some... Something, I don't know what. <laughs> Are you tired yet? No. Can, should we go a little? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just as long as I don't have to rush, I don't get tired. I mean, if I have to seduce you, I get tired. But if I don't, it's just like a, a ball bearing wheel, it just keeps going. Because I'm just reflecting with you about all this stuff. I don't understand most of it. <laughs> I mean, this isn't, there's not an object lesson here, as I told you. Is... So she keeps um, meditating, and suddenly, one night, there is this fat man sitting on her toilet seat. As she describes him, he's sitting there with his tomatoes hanging out. This is my teacher. Right? <laughs> it could only happen in America. <laughs> and he won't talk to her. And she's freaked because he's sitting there and she grabs a towel and puts it over herself, she's sitting naked in the bathtub. And after that, every night she goes into the bathtub taking a bath with a nightgown on. <laughs> and her husband, who controls the whole scene totally, you know, Italian, Sicilian, mm. you know, she's got to sneak the bath, the, the a nightgown into the washing machine quick, because if he found a wet nightgown, she'd have to explain, and you know, that's all. And night after night, this fat man comes, and all he'll do is go, hmm, hmm. <laughs> He's sitting there. And she finally says, look, if you don't start talking, I'm going to throw you out. I'm going to tell my husband. Jigs up. 
<laughs> so he starts to teach her, and he's really tough. He hits her in the belly, and she sits like this, and he's teaching her all kinds of stuff. She has no idea who he is. She's got a girlfriend who's into yoga. She's talking to her girlfriend about it. <clears throat> her girlfriend says, there's somebody downtown in New York who might know. So she goes and she tells about the description of this guy and they say, oh yeah, that's Swami Nityananda. Mm -hmm. He was Swami Muktananda's guru and he was also the guru of this woman, Hilda. And he died in about 1964. And Swami Nityananda was a very far out guy, by the way. He was the guy, there's that lovely story I love to tell about him. He used to have roads made around between poor villages, you know. And he'd say to the workmen when they were going home, he'd say, on your way home, pick up any rock, and under the rock will be your two rupees. Not any other rock, just whichever rock you pick up first, right? So they go home and they all trusted him, because in India, see, people believe in all this, because miracles are part of the fabric of life, not like it is here. So they just pick up a rock near their home and there'd be the two rupees and they'd take it home. See, but the problem was that these were all new rupee notes. So one day the police um, lieutenant, I guess, and his sergeant arrived, this police inspector, I guess, and he said, Babaji, um, I, I'm sorry to bother you, but he said, uh, there's some confusion in our minds about these rupee notes because they're all brand new rupee notes and we don't know where they're coming from. And he says, oh, I can understand your confusion. I'll show you. Come, I'll show you where they're coming from. So he leads the inspector and his sergeant into the jungle, deeper and deeper into the jungle. And they come to a, a pond in which there are alligators. He walks into the pond and he calls an alligator. Alligator comes over and he opens the alligator's mouth and he reaches and he starts to pull out rupee notes. <laughs> and the inspector freaks and the sergeant freaks and they all run away. That's the kind of guy he was. <laughs> A merry prankster. So she goes to see Hilda, and she sits down, and she comes into Hilda, and Hilda's been this nice spiritual lady who's lived in India for 18 years. And um, this gal, Joya, calls Hilda, and she says, I don't even know how to talk to a holy lady. Uh, and she comes over to see her, and she goes in to see Hilda, and Hilda just touches her, and Joya goes into samadhi for the first time. Okay, so that's the beginning of it, and that's only uh, about three months before I meet her. And what's happening is she's going up into these high states. If you've read any of Edgar Cayce stuff, you know how he'd go into these other planes and all this stuff would come out of him and then he'd come back into the physical plane and he didn't know what had happened. And there's this discontinuity between planes of consciousness. And that was what was happening. She'd go up into these planes and then she'd come back down and she didn't know what had happened. So she didn't get any benefit from it on this plane, you understand? But we would get this incredible benefit from all this stuff that would pour out of her from these other planes of consciousness. So her, the only way her husband would allow her to even have a candle or a holy picture was in the bathroom. So the bathroom got so that you couldn't find a space on the wall that didn't have holy pictures and there were candles and the kids were freaking. The 15-year-old boy, hey, Ma, how can I bring my friends here? What kind of a weird scene is this? You know? <laughs> And uh, she was having very bad trouble keeping contact on the physical plane. Like I'd be on the phone, she said, I'm cooking dinner. And I'd hear a strange sound over the phone. And I'd say, well, what are you cooking? She'd say, just a minute. I See, she'd be blind. This is very weird. She's, most of the time, she was outside of the physical plane, so she was seeing only through her third eye, not through these two eyes, so she'd be blind on this level. And it was very weird because she could, I'd be sitting with her, she'd be driving on the parkway in New York, like 70 miles an hour in her Cadillac, with her eyes closed. Okay? She's watching it with her third eye from over the car, right? 
<laughs> I'm pushing you, I know, but I figure I had to go through it. Why shouldn't you? It's too heavy, go home. It's okay with me. <laughs> So I said, there's a funny sound, what is it? She says, well, I'm cooking. She said, just a minute, I'll tap my forehead and see. She taps her foot and she says, I'm cooking meat. I said, that's a good thing to be doing. <laughs> yeah, I said, well, um, let's see. It still sounds strange. I said, do you have a pan? Where are you cooking it, in the oven? She says, no, on the stove. I said, that's good. I said, is there a pan? Just a minute, oh shit. <laughs> And it was like, she couldn't quite, she'd almost get it together, but not quite. You see, it would just be that little thing, she just forgot the pan, everything else was together. So her husband would sit down to dinner where the table was set and she'd put on like one piece of bread. Because she couldn't quite get it together, you know, or she'd order seven roast beefs. You know, she couldn't, uh, she just was losing, he was losing her ground. She had lost all her sensitivity. She couldn't feel anything on this plane at all. She never felt where she walked. She could burn herself and have no feeling. She was almost like anesthetized on this plane. And was going in every night. Now, she finally she got a little closet downstairs that was made over that she was allowed to be in. And she'd lock herself in there at night. And she would go into samadhi every night and then at five she'd set the that internal alarm clock we all have that you've all used and she'd then come out of it at like 523 get up quick go up get into bed with her husband so at 530 he'd wake up thinking she had been in bed all night and then she'd be a housewife eh, as well as she could with all us holding on to her with a telephone saying come down come down wherever you are and her tapping her head and you know the husband would leave for work at five minutes of seven, and at seven, we'd come in. They, <laughs> there'd be yoga teaching, house cleaning, everything going on for about five hours. At one o'clock, when he comes home, at two minutes of one, we'd all scurry out of the house, and the husband would drive up, and the house would be clean, and the food would all be cooked, and we'd have her down enough to walk out and say, hello, dear, and, <laughs> and I was like... This went on, there were a few slips in the game, see, I mean, he'd take her to the dentist and she'd go stiff in the dentist chair, or uh, she got the stigmata on Good Friday and she had to wear a bandana because there was a dinner party, and it's like, I mean, you're hearing all these bizarre juxtapositions of things where such a being you would usually say, wow, uh, you know, and here it is that, hey, ma, where's my underwear, you know, and... I'm coming, you know, come on down, come on down, come on down. Come on down. She'd be coming. She had just been talking as uh, Socrates had been giving me teachings, right? Hey, Ma, you know, and there goes Socrates, and what is it? What? What's happening? Your, your son is calling you. You've got to come down. He wants his underwear. Now come down, come down, come down. We're all by this time totally, since we can't be around the house the hours when her husband's home, we're all on earphones at our houses, see? We've had the telephone company put in earphones because we're sitting there like seven, eight hours a day. Because her whole connection to the reality of these telephones. So my life is getting very peculiar because uh, I have to get up every morning at five to be at her house at seven. And the last telephone call usually ends as she goes into Samadhi at two in the morning. So I'm functioning like for eight months on three hours sleep a night. All day going. Like this. Get there at seven, teachings all morning in which she's taking me up into higher and higher states, into samadhi states. Then I'm in a samadhi state, you know, and I'm just getting stiff and I'm out and I'm in this incredible plane of consciousness and she says, somebody comes in and says, quick, her husband's coming. <laughs> And it's, yeah, that's really, that's more worse than how much money does Stephen make, you know, because you got to get down, get up, get out, get into your car and remember it's a car. I mean, first of all, start the engine and drive away. And this, you've got to understand that you've got a choice of either deciding the whole scene is totally out of control and totally insane, or this is the essence of tantric teaching. You understand the choice? 
Because if it's the essence of tantric teaching, you're being forced to keep it together. You're being forced to go up and down and keep the planes and you're not being allowed and you're constantly... And as far as some moments I'm thinking, the husband and the kids don't really exist, they're all astral shades and the whole thing has been created as a teaching, right? <laughs> right, and this is all Maharaji's dance and there isn't any such scene and I'm sure if I drove by here on an off day, that house probably, there's probably a lot, an empty lot there. <laughs> Something else, I don't know, it's too... It's too unrealistic from where I'm sitting. 